Hopefully online colleagues, it's clear. I think we are, yeah, we're getting that echo resolved. And as long as you can still hear us online, we can proceed. So I'm really pleased to be joined today by Jonas Bellina from the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, Fanny Weisherding, my colleague from the Center from Humanitarian Data, and Vincent Cassar from the ICRC. And together we sort of are representing today what we call the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative, which brings together OCHA, Switzerland, and the ICRC to look at different issues related to the responsible use of technology and data in the sector, and specifically uh, today, how we can promote more responsible practice between humanitarians and donors. So I will start sharing my screen again as we open up the conversation to sort of ground the discussion and what we're talking about when we talk about data in humanitarian action. For this, Vincent, I will go first to you to ask you just to share a few examples of humanitarian data management and how this connects to ICRC's work. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. I will I will share a kind of very simplistic element of how data is collected and then shared with donors. Uh, the, uh, bear with me in terms of simplicity, but I guess it's the uh, best way to int enter into the, the discussion on the on the topic. Um, we have been extremely. I mean, we are as an organization extremely careful in terms of. Uh, strong commitment for in terms of information security and data protection in the management of our of the of the data and personal data, especially uh, notably after the incident we suffered last year with a breach of uh, some of our data sets within the central tracing agency. Uh, but the the question here today is a bit more niche, but uh, it's about data sharing with donors. And in fact, it's within a broader discussion on uh, responsible uh, processing of, of data and of personal data. Uh, but the question is why, why, why do we have this specific discussion? Because it seems something quite straightforward. There's a number of commitments uh, between donors and organization uh, and uh, needs regarding uh, accountability, uh, control, understanding of the framework. So it's pretty straightforward. In fact, we realize that uh, that there is a need for a specific discussion precisely because this donor organization relationship is, has an influence and a strong influence on the data processing uh, we are uh, we are we are managing daily. So first, if there is a simple example of uh, an assessment for a shelter program, so I'm basically we are looking for information regarding families uh, that would need a shelter so we would need a number of family members we would need to understand uh, where they are located and uh, if they if they if they fit the category of a shelter program so it's pretty basic information that we need for this shelter program assessment so immediately the first question that comes do we really need to include in this collection uh, elements regarding the I don't, the gender of the uh, family members, because de facto it's something that we will have to report upon. Do we need to have the age of everybody in the family and their identity? And uh, do we need as well to have information on their health status and notably disability, which is a, a, a common requirement in terms of reporting? Uh, there we can see that <laughs> It's not only an operational question, uh, but it's as well a question related to some some requests uh, and needs uh, from from donors. Uh, then, who is processing with this collection of information? In practice, in in many cases, it could be done by a third party provider or a partner organization. And the question is how far this partner organization is properly informed on the purposes for this data collection, how far uh, they can ensure transparency and provide accountability to this affected population, how far can they explain them, uh, wh why this data is processed. And with the complex system of data collection, it's, it's another question sometimes linked with, with the donor's uh, request. Implicitly as well, we have cases uh, where there is an increased collection of data because there is an implicit a perception of an implicit conditionalities between data collection to so increase data collection and a potential uh, funding by by the donor that's an implicit one it's not always direct but it has a role in terms of uh, the increased uh, data collection 
so that's a number of questions that, that are coming. Then we're talking about sharing of disaggregated data, so mainly statistics. So normally, or in many of the, most of the cases, this is innocuous and not a very problematic data sharing. In reality, that raises a number of questions. First, because there are exceptions, de facto, through we do share disaggregated data under a predefined framework with donors, but you will have exceptions, for example, on the sample check for, uh, for a specific group of individuals that is affected, or you will have informal practice just sharing uh, between counterparts on, at, the, at the national level on, of list of beneficiaries. Um, and these informal practices uh, as well increase the data collection. Then there's a question of risk, because obviously the, the question of uh, data sharing is linked to the risk. How is there a risk for this data sharing and how do we mitigate them or how do we, uh, how do we manage this risk? There again, a number of questions because the, the, these disaggregated data that will seem innocuous can represent a risk in specific circumstances. And for this, uh, we realized that there was really not always an alignment between donors and organization because it's really context specific, it's related to the mandate, to what is happening. And this requires as well a, a discussion. Then the way you mitigate the risk for example, if I think that a specific category or group of people is could be at risk because they are persecuted and they are at risk of being re-identified, if it's a small group of individuals that are beneficiaries, I will not share the statistics, for example, I will arbitrarily or say I, as an organization I can share, but if, if, the, if the group of beneficiaries below, below 10, for example, that will, could lead to re-identification, I will not share. But it's a decision that I'm making based on okay, some analysis, but it's not a shared decision between the donors and the, the organization. So there again, there is a need to, to discuss these um, mitigation measures. So it's very simple. I didn't go through a very uh, high level analysis, but we can see that from the collection to the sharing, there's a number of questions that needs a joint discussion between donors and a humanitarian organization, precisely because some of this data collection is driven by either the perception of a donor's request or the reality of specific needs uh, uh, of the donors. And um, voilà, that's how we, we started this conversation uh, uh, because of all this question. And it was important not to have this conversation in the in the framework of a specific case where we are negotiating a budget or negotiating the implementation of a program, but outside sitting back uh, and having these conversations that can be sometimes difficult, notably if we have this question of perception, uh, um, the, having this conversation outside of, a, of a, an existing partnership agreement. Voila. Thanks so much, Vincent. I'm not sure how simple all of that sounds, but I think the, the way you've described the different stakes here from a humanitarian perspective also demonstrates that as a sector, we've gained quite a lot of expertise and insight over the past several years on the operational side of this conversation. But as you alluded to just now, we a few years ago embarked on a process specifically looking at the dimension of data sharing with donors because it's an area where there has been less guidance less perhaps sort of system-wide collaboration and less clarity on how to get this right. So what I'd like to do now is ask Fanny if you could explain a bit the process that we embarked on, the dialogue process as the HTTI, and some of the key opportunities and constraints specific to data sharing with donors that emerged from that process. Sure. Um, I mean, the dialogue process itself um, was started with the putting it together the HDCI, the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative. Um, this is an initiative hosted by the Swiss government, the ICRC and OCHA. Um, and from there, one of the key issues we wanted to discuss within this initiative was this issue of data sharing between humanitarians and, and donors. And so in order to come up with, you know, a common understanding, a common path forward, uh, we organized a number of uh, Wilton Park consultations, for example, where, you know, representatives of both donor governments and humanitarian organizations participated. And this, we started with one initial event that was really supposed to tease out 
what the common stakes were, what the common understandings of certain risks, but also the common understanding of what, for what purpose is this data being requested from humanitarian organizations from donors? Like, what are they trying to understand when they request this data? From there, we built the first understanding of, of these stakes and then uh, commissioned two research projects. Um, one specifically on the, the risks that come with such data sharing, even the data sharing that, as Vincent has, has alluded to, seems innocuous. Um, and a second research project specifically on um, what agreements are in place between donors and organizations and what purposes do donors indicate on why they are requesting certain types of data to get a better understanding of what type of data is actually needed to fulfill those purposes so we can reduce the amount of data that is collected and then subsequently never used because it's not the right data for the purpose that it was requested for. So to give a brief overview maybe of what those research projects and events you know, concluded, um, a lot of there's a lot of documentation documentation available on what donors are requesting what types of agreements they are entering into with their humanitarian partners uh, some of the purposes they list are improved situational awareness better accountability a better way to monitor where their money is going who is receiving aid a lot of donors work against uh, certain markers maybe gender markers children, disability, and obviously you might already guess, but some of these categories are, of course, somewhat sensitive information, even when it is disaggregated. Um, it can also lead, this can also lead to some sort of odd incentive where organizations collecting data on the ground are like, hmm, this donor really likes data on disability. I'm just going to now go ahead and collect a lot of data on certain you know, vulnerable characteristics of populations that I'm serving, even where this data might not be necessary, as Vincent has indicated, for certain assessments. So this leads directly, obviously, into the work we've done on understanding the risks of this data sharing. So uh, even when data is no longer personal, it can still be sensitive. Um, there's also the question of even if you remove personal data from data sets, Statistically, sometimes if there is a singular person in your data set that has a number of characteristics, it's not exactly like your data set is anonymized. If I can find the singular person that fulfills all these little points that I've collected about them. So there's a risk of re-identification. This risk ties directly to, you know, a violation of human rights to privacy, or human right to data protection. Uh, furthermore, and maybe this risk Kind of compounds the other risks is that a lot of uh, both donors that request this data but also the humanitarian officers that receive the requests might quite simply not be aware of this risk they might also feel pressure to despite the risk still provide the data because you know we're speaking about funding uh, there are power imbalances at stake when a donor uh, is calling and asking you to hand over data and they might even provide you with what sounds like a good reason, and you're just not entirely sure how to like push back on such on such requests. And so furthermore, on the donor side, there might also generally be an unawareness of you know purpose specification. You just want someone ask you, oh, let's see the last figures on X project, and you just reach out to the person you know at that project and like, send me everything you have. And that might seem like a well-intended you know, request, and you assume that what they share won't be sensitive, but it's kind of all based on an assumed level of awareness and understanding of the different risks that throughout this process we found is not always a given. And it's also placing a burden on partners that you know, are juggling a bunch of other requests and difficulties, and they just want to do their best, but they just might be overwhelmed in a given moment, or generally not un just unaware of the, the risk they're putting those affected people whose data they're sharing in. And so it leads further to a problem of you know, data being shared for one purpose, uh, but maybe there's a lack of awareness of purpose specification. So now I have this beautiful data set full of things, and I'm like, wow, this could be really useful to you know, used for promotional material, and there's now a situation where the data was asked for a specific thing, maybe, you know, accountability, I need to show the numbers where this data has gone. 
and now suddenly it has moved into an, an area where it wasn't requested for. And this, again, is also a violation of data protection because data should only ever be shared for a specified purpose. Um, I think that explains some of the stakes and some of the issues that might come into play, but at this seemingly innocuous sharing that <laughs> can sometimes be a little less innocuous. Yeah, in many ways, the road to problematic data requests are often paved with good intentions, but I think a lot of what you just shared, Fani, points to the fact that there is a lot of complexity to understand here and the levels of awareness and understanding very widely within and across organizations. This is true of the humanitarian community, but it's also true of the donor community. And Jonas, I think it'd be great to hear a bit from your perspective, both as a donor, but also as someone who's been directly involved in convening this dialogue process. What is the level of awareness and understanding on the donor side of this discussion of some of the different issues that Vincent and Fanny have flagged? And then which of those opportunities and constraints or risks and benefits seem most urgently relevant to your own work uh, as a donor? Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so I think in the last uh, couple of years, actually, uh, the level of awareness uh, has increased, however, um, I think it's still limited. It might still be perceived in some cases as a niche topic, um, and certainly there is room for improvement. Um, also, I think it's important to uh, understand that actually the donor community, it's not just a, a homogeneous community, but it's quite um, heterogeneous in the sense that there's different uh, levels of awareness. And even within individual governments, um, there's different divisions, different units. You have uh, uh, staff at headquarter level. Um, you have uh, field, uh, you know, uh, staff in the field. Um, and so they deal with different questions. And uh, given to their exposure and work, I think they also have naturally uh, different levels um, of awareness. So in the process that uh, Fanny mentioned, uh, this uh, uh, dialogue process uh, between humanitarian organizations and donor states, it was actually crucial to identify and bring together uh, the right people with the right uh, expertise uh, to have a meaningful discussion. And this is not always easy because sometimes you have legal experts or people with uh, uh, you know, operational expertise or uh, policy people and so you need all these different aspects but uh, rarely there's one person who actually bring that uh, brings that uh, uh, all together in one person um, then i think what um, definitely is a challenge or was a challenge is a lack of a common understanding of the risks that are there and also the opportunities so i think this process was actually crucial to build uh, that uh, common understanding. I think that was really, uh, you know, a very important fundament of that whole conversation. Um, and then maybe related to your uh, specific questions, I, I think first of all, as a donor states, we really want to and also have a responsibility to create the environment that is conducive for humanitarian organizations uh, to, to carry out um, their uh, mandate and if we think about uh, some of the uh, issues or challenges uh, what Fanny mentioned about the perceived uh, power dynamics um, I think uh, you know it's easy as a donor not to be aware of this uh, dynamic because in your daily work uh, you're in contact with humanitarian organizations be it uh, smaller organizations or uh, bigger agencies and um, it might escape that some organizations, they might feel pressured uh, to, to maybe hand over some information they might not entirely uh, feel comfortable with, but wouldn't necessarily uh, tell you because in the end, uh, humanitarian organizations uh, with tight budgets are competing for, um, for funding. And so I think it's important that we as donors are really aware um, of that. And, don't put humanitarian organizations in a situation where they feel pressured, but where they actually have kind of a, uh, you know, uh, clear procedures also um, uh, to know what uh, can be expected to be shared and what's maybe uh, too much. Um, 
and also to prevent kind of uh, over collection uh, on the site uh, from donors. Um, and I think as uh, Fanny and as, as you, Stuart, mentioned, uh, I, it, it's not that there's uh, necessarily bad intentions uh, with donor states, of course, but it's really, um, in most cases, just a, a lack of this uh, specific awareness. Um, an additional uh, point I feel is, is really important just to uh, always remind us as donors that um, data uh, should be collected for humanitarian purposes. So also uh, really um, uh, be uh, focused on that. Um, and then if we ask for, for, for data, do it with an understanding that's uh, done for a specific purpose and not just for the sake of collecting data, uh, as having the data, but not really knowing um, what to do with it. I think that was one of the, uh, of the more interesting uh, findings of uh, the study by the University of uh, Manchester, actually, that, um, you know, in some cases, data has, has been collected, uh, but really, in the end, it was not clear for what purpose exactly. And I think that we just have to be um, aware. So don't uh, put unnecessary pressure on humanitarian organizations and uh, create kind of a vicious circle that they would want to provide more and more data and us not asking for more and more data if there's no specific purpose or if it's uh, in, in contradiction or not in line with um, humanitarian purposes. Thanks so much, Jonas. And I think uh, much of your remarks there reflect the spirit of the process and why mm -hmm. we embarked on it in the first place. And now I want to shift into the framework itself and sort of what we can do to move forward on some of the different recommendations you've all been sharing about getting this right. So, Vincent, I'll come back to you and we have some slides just to support colleagues online as we walk through, but um, Give us also just maybe to mention to the audience this is the first time we're presenting the framework publicly. So you're the first people to to see this content live. We will, of course, share a link to the framework in the chat to this event and as a follow up for anyone who's registered and we do have some copies of it here if you're interested. So, Vincent, please walk us through the sort of key components of the framework to give us a grounding for then diving into how as humanitarians and donors, we can sort of put this into practice. And then maybe just very quickly, uh, a reminder to colleagues online and in the room that we do have about 15 minutes at the end of the session for Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free to already drop them into the chat or jot them down, and then we'll open up the discussion after this round of interventions. So Vincent, over to you. Thank you. So uh, for a clarification, this framework is really, uh, limited or focused on situation where humanitarian organizations are sharing disaggregated data with donors, uh, which is uh, the main component of the discussion. And it's clearly something done with an objective to uh, develop a responsible approach to this data sharing and an approach that is a joint process between humanitarian organization and donors. So all the points uh, have been designed and drafted carefully uh, to to make sure that both organization and donors can can make progress together on that it's an iterative process uh, so the first um so there's six six points on on this uh, principle framework the first one is uh i don't know if i can yeah is uh, about is prioritize rights and needs of the affected population it's a EU Mediterranean principle, it can seem an obvious one, but the reason why we put it at the beginning is that we realize that through the research work and the experience we have seen, is that it's actually extremely difficult to ensure that affected population are uh, aware properly uh, uh, and capable of making choices and control the the processing of their of their data basically we realize that that there the fact that there's a long chain maybe of of data processing between different actors uh, between in terms of collection of data and and the fact that the purpose might be designed at a headquarter uh, joint agreement between a donor and um, an organization but uh, we have to make sure that at the last mile so at the affected population level there is a strong uh, capacity for them 
to 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 have a to get a contability and make choices, and that their interest is, remains at the centre. Uh, then the second the second point is on a clarity of the purpose of data sharing. It's uh, it's as we mentioned there's a number of elements related to some uncertainty of what donors want why do they want this maybe they want more and providing clarity is essential to make progress and to ensure not to be a minimization of the data that is collected so collecting data only for a specific purpose and not uh, going beyond that so uh, this this is as well important as we've we've seen a number of examples where uh, there's ad hoc request or ad hoc sharing that are happening along the way for plenty of good reasons but that uh, that are not really uh, that can be problematic in terms of responsibility responsible management of the data the third point is uh, um, more on the process on the fact that uh, on the importance of clarifying and for formalizing the requirements for responsible data sharing so basically establishing proper data sharing agreements setting uh, the legal framework, the responsibility of all the stakeholders, and uh, that's common good practice, but it's usually done quite well at the central level, much less when you go down the chain, uh, especially if there's a number of uh, uh, partners or third party providers in terms of data collection uh, uh, in the process. So uh, that's the third point. Then uh, the fourth point is if the is linked to the fact that we identified plenty of uh, different understanding of what the risk is and how to mitigate them. So it's really to have a joint commitment and, pro and, and have joint projects to, uh, to define, to have a common understanding and approach to assess the risks and to find mitigations uh, to assess this risk. I mentioned the example of possibly a, a small, uh, if I have to, as an organization, if I have to report on a, a small group of individuals that are beneficiaries and that are especially vulnerable, I will probably uh, decide not to, uh, to avoid a re-identification and defining what is the threshold and does it, where does it make sense has to be a common endeavor between donors and humanitarian organization. Uh, then, obviously, in order to to, to fulfil this uh, this this uh, this uh, principles, it's really important to have a proper capacity within the sector and within the whole sector, not only at headquarter level, uh, and uh, to to invest basically on training and capacity building for responsible data sharing, and that's uh, an important one. And the last point is actually quite, I think, uh, forward-thinking one, is the fact that maybe this, uh, this discussion is probably as well as an opportunity to, 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 contribute, to contribute not only to a common understanding, but as well to learning and development in, in this topic, and uh, to, to provide uh, either additional research or, or guidelines in terms of responsible uh, data sharing as uh, this, this risk management in data, uh, data sharing and data management is a, is a, I don't know if it's a growing, but I guess, yeah, we can say it's a growing <laughs> challenge and uh, one we need to, to, to solve or to, uh, to manage uh, together. Uh, voilà. Great, Vincent, thank you so much. And I realize uh, for colleagues in the room and online, that's quite a lot of content to get through. Uh, don't worry, we wrote more words than those. There is a sort of double click under each of those six headlines of instructions along the lines of what the, the panelists have already been speaking to. So a humanitarian organization should do X, Y, and Z to uphold the different guidelines. Similarly for donors, uh, this is articulated in the framework. So again, you'll see that more practical detail there. But for now, I just wanna hear from Fanny and then Vincent about a couple practical actions that first humanitarians and then donors can take in line with this framework to kind of put this into practice and make it more real uh, and tangible for colleagues and the people that we serve in the field. Yes, thank you. Because um, as, as Stuart said, we have written a lot of words, but it's always great to put these words to practice and to 
already think about what, how we want to see these words actually be used to create what we want from this framework, which is a better overall standard of how we approach data sharing between humanitarian organizations and, and donors. So from OCHA's perspective, I think a good, uh, a good starting point is maybe the principle um, that was about a common understanding of assessment and mitigation of risk. This is something we're also trying to drive forward um, ourselves in our work. Um, OCHA has developed, for example, a template for data impact assessments. It's a practice we really are striving to push more and more, which is just a common, like a good approach to whenever you are conducting projects that involve the collection and management of data, that you take a moment to sit down and think about the possible impacts of that data collection and data management, including uh, minimizing the data you will collect, because obviously, as some of you, most of you, if you've worked with data, might know the only data you can actually keep safe is the data you've never collected in the first place. So this is maybe one step that most organizations can try and improve on to just really take the time before starting certain management exercises to investigate what risks this data collection, this data management might, you know, uh, create and to mitigate them before starting the project. This is something that's going to be really difficult to do re retroactively. It's something that will not be done well if it's done retroactively, because then we'll see mostly that um, the risks will be adapted to what we've already done. And that's not what we want to see. So, you know, developing templates to support partners, to support staff uh, being available to support this exercise. Uh, and encouraging um, partners and staff to conduct such impact as assessment is one example um, I can think of. Maybe another one we also see a lot is just thinking, uh, thinking of this framework as something that you're not going to just copy paste, but something that you want to live in practice. So maybe the, the coordination and collaboration and common understanding aspect of it is a good way of thinking about it. So maybe something we as OCHA have done a couple of times is in with with our country offices, we look into uh, given how much data is collected and how much data is managed and shared in a given country or context. Can we come up with a common framework or a common understanding, a common document on how such data should be shared based on a common understanding of levels of sensitivity of different types of data? So this is what we call an information sharing protocol. We have them in place in a few contexts, and they're just, you know, based on a classification of different types of data that might be more or less sensitive, and that we just agree, you know, with partners in country, with donors, with authorities on, according to the level of sensitivity, how will a certain type of data be shared? And this obviously includes, you know, data that is disaggregated to a certain point can be shared with donors under these circumstances in this format and via this method of sharing. So this again is just another way to like interpret the framework to work towards a better standards and a more coordinated approach of sharing certain types of data in a way that, you know, maximizes the use because we also don't want to create a situation where data is collected, data is available we're not sharing it, so now we're going to have to go out and collect it again. And, you know, this again is a great burden placed on, you know, people affected by population having to go through an assessment five times when it could have just been coordinated and shared in a more effective manner. So I think that's uh, two two examples I can I can share from from our point of view. Great, thanks so much. And just to quickly pick up on that last point, I think it's really important to be clear that this work and the resulting framework, but also data protection and data responsibility more broadly in the sector is about making sure that data is flowing to the people that need it in the format that is safe, responsible and effective for doing so. It is not about locking down data. It is not about creating sort of different communities within the broader humanitarian system where data is stuck between partners for concern about sensitivity or lack of agreement. We're trying to make a more common approach to this work and make sure that we are sharing whatever data it is safe, ethical and effective to share, but also making sure that we protect data and the people that we serve with common approaches to understanding and mitigating risk. So much of what Fanny shared is on the more operational side, Jonas, perhaps from a more 
global or capital perspective, but also if you wish from the operational level, what are a few steps that donors can take to also put into practice the framework that Vincent walked us through? Thank you. Without the framework in the common space, which is now the case, um, so that there can be a good uptake uh, and uh, that uh, donor states, as well as humanitarian organizations, they are well aware of it and of its relevance. Um, but then, of course, it contains these uh, six guidelines, and you have heard them from uh, from Vincent and uh, also from Fanny, uh, some of its contents. Uh, but then the question is, okay, now we have these guidelines, but how can we actually really apply that in practice? And I think that's uh, the challenge, uh, but in a good way, um, because in many cases, it's not... Um, you know, very clear situations. If we talk to colleagues uh, in the field, uh, the questions they are faced with in their daily work, uh, it's really um, sometimes kind of dilemmas. And um, uh, for them, this framework is very useful in, uh, in, in knowing how to deal with these situations. And so for that purpose, for implementing the framework, for example, as Switzerland, we have um, organized a workshop, uh, so the Swiss uh, Development Corporation, as well as the Swiss Peace and Human Rights Division for members of the uh, Swiss uh, administration um, to really exactly learn how uh, to apply this framework in their daily work to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, such situations in the best possible way. Um, also, then, that implies applying certain tools such as uh, as Fanny mentioned, you know, that can be a data sensitivity assessment or also, uh, you know, how could we apply uh, data sharing agreements in our funding contracts and so on. Um, and so for all these individual cases, which are each one different from the other, uh, to have the best uh, possible approach. Um, and so I think uh, from the feedbacks that we got, it was really useful. Um, particularly since uh, ICRC as well as OCHA uh, came to that workshop to um, to really discuss uh, more uh, the contents and the purpose of the different guidelines of the framework and uh, how it could apply it toward, uh, towards uh, the specific situations that colleagues in the field as well as at the headquarters um, have encountered. And so I think this was a good experience which means that we are going to continue such workshops in the future. And I think also other donor states in the future could uh, hugely benefit from that. This is just one aspect, of course, um, and there's many more, but I think I'll stop here and so that Perfect. we can <clears throat> more go into that uh, during Q&A. Great. No, that is really helpful, Jonas, and I think gives a good sense of how, even as uh, a state that was directly involved in this process, there's still a lot of need for connecting dots internally, finding a common language within and across organizations, which is you know, part of the spirit of this week. It's also making sure that we're all understanding and speaking about the issue in terms that intersect and that allow us to make progress together rather than having sort of siloed conversations, which is why now we're going to move into the Q&A with the time we have left. And I will stop sharing my screen so I can see the chat. But we'd really welcome uh, questions from colleagues online or here in the room with us in Geneva to either, you know, one specific panelist or a general question, depending on what you're curious to hear about. So I'll check the chat, but also in the room. In the meantime, I see one hand. Yes, Amos. So over to you first. And I hope, yes, our sound guys are on top of it. So. Hopefully this works. Uh, yes. <laughs> great. Thanks, everyone, for, for sharing. Great to learn more about what's been going on. Just a couple of specific questions, really. One is, is, Stuart, you mentioned that it's called the Humanitarian Data Trust Initiative. Um, for me, a data trust signifies a certain thing um, and a certain specific legal entity. Just wondering if you can explain a little bit more about why you use that term and if, um, if it is what I think it is or if it's something different. And then, um, Vincent, your last comments, you talked about wanting to try to ensure that the data subject, the beneficiary, has control over how their data is processed and with whom it's shared, et cetera. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that happened, how you see that actually happening practically. 
um, because often the ch there's a quite a long chain between the uh, beneficiary to a, could be a local organization, an NGO, and then to a UN agency before it even gets the donor, and how that uh, discussion or <laughs> conversation between the data subject and of the sharing of the data actually practically can happen. Um, and then lastly, Jonas, you talked about more workshops. It'd be interesting to hear um, about uh, how other people could get involved with those, if that's possible or not. So, thanks. Great. Why don't we couple a few questions here in the room? So I'll come to you next, ma'am, and then to you, sir. Hi, um, I'm speaking as an academic, so this is probably a stupid question, and you, you've explained a lot of this, and I might have missed it, but what, a lot of what you said is very familiar to academics doing research. and any university ethics board. And I just wonder, you, I didn't hear the word consent, so I wonder where that comes into this process. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. And yes, here. Uh, oh, there. Jeffrey Vives is from IMAP. My, uh, my question is, so I'm about to work on a, in a consortium with ACAPS and REACH in Colombia, and the idea behind it is also to work directly with the donors, not just with uh, with OCHES is usually the case. And I'm interested in knowing if there are other cases like this where donors want to become directly involved in uh, data uh, consultation. We're trying to figure out how to uh, measure decision making, like how do they choose who the stakeholders are, how to give them a weight in prioritizing different types of products that they want. So, I mean, it's a, it goes beyond just the data management per se, but that's a big part of it, what you're discussing here. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. So a quick clarification to answer Amos's first question, and then I'll turn to the panel for the various questions that we've received. There's an and between the data and the trust words there. So it's the humanitarian data and trust initiative. We are not, at least currently, looking at the concept of data trust. There are others in the sector much farther along uh, than we would be in doing that. And of course, it is a relevant concept, but it's not part of our, our sort of strategic thinking as uh, the Swiss, OCHA, and the ICRC on this particular set of issues. In terms of um, some of the, the first points, Vincent, I would come to you just in terms of Amos's other questions around particularly the the informing of the people whose data we are collecting and potentially sharing of how that will be done and, and some of the other broader questions around data portability and other data rights. And perhaps also you can touch on consent very quickly. And then uh, Jonas, perhaps you can speak to the question around the more direct involvement of donors uh, in either yeah, data consultation analysis or, or process uh, being designed and implemented in humanitarian settings. Um, really, the inf I mean, the, the, the ensuring that beneficiaries or data subjects uh, uh, can exercise their right, notably in terms of data protection, personal data protection, is, is it's a key issue that <laughs> goes much beyond this dialogue with donors. But it's a key uh, uh, concern uh, that we have on a daily basis. And the importance here is about ensuring in practice, that there is a proper information of uh, individuals on the fact that some of this data or some of, I mean, data collection can lead to some reporting to to a number to some do, to donors, and it's it's actually difficult and rare that there is this granularity of information, but it is possible because we we've experienced that, in fact, we we can manage to to include this information in the different form of information sharing. I mean, the the, the information. The, the basic information notice to, to when we collect data, it can be very formal on a paper or with a click, but usually it can be it can be as well oral. But what is important is to include this information uh, of why the data is collected, how it will be used for operational reasons, but as well potentially for some reporting to donors. And it's a challenge. It's difficult, but it's really it's feasible, basically, if we manage to, to, we think about it, we can manage ways to do it, uh, and including the elements related to their specific rights, the fact that they can come back to the organization, there's a focal point on uh, and where they can exercise their right in terms of 
correction or deletion or just access if they need. So that's really basic uh, or fundamental, basic, not in a sense simple, but fundamental <laughs> uh, data protection rights of individual. And, and this dialogue reinforced this need because we realized that clearly at the, at the beneficiary level, there was a limited understanding of this aspect of things, the uh, sharing with donors. Uh, and the point is to have this through the chain of data processing because there's different actors and for a third party processor, it's often difficult to just have this information, therefore to share it with beneficiaries. So it's a long work. Uh, then cons link to consent, uh, because um, then there's two two elements on consent. It's uh, if, if you ask me, I mean me, not me, but the data protection officer, <laughs> as a data protection officer, I will tell you that consent is only one of the legal basis for data collection and that in many cases, it's not very, it's not the first one for in humanitarian uh, settings because there's really a power imbalance that makes it very difficult for individuals to basically uh, refuse. Uh, however, there's a number of elements in terms of health programs or research where consent is, is a key as well to the proceeding of a trusted uh, medical processing or, or research process. So um, there, I would say that we're back to the initial point in terms of proper information, note information of the individuals and that could lead to a consent or not. The consent could be a legal basis or not. It could be a basis as well for a program, but not for data processing. In a way, that's for lawyers to solve, but the starting point is really a clear information and uh, recognizing that it's a challenge, but it's a, it's a feasible exercise. We, we see it on a daily basis that we manage in different contexts with different understanding of what is privacy, because in different cultures, there's not always a clear understanding or, of, or, or, or there's not a clear or a different understanding of what it means. And in fact, it's, it's very simple information and it's possible to share it. The, the point is to make the effort and uh, uh, take time to share it properly um, so that people can have a decision or at least an, have an understanding and then a decision on, on the processing of their personal data. Well. Great, thank you so much, Vincent. And just acknowledging there is one question in the chat, so we'll come to that next, and then if there are any other questions in the room. But first, Jonas, over to you. The question on whether, either in your own experience from Switzerland side or in discussions with your peers, you're seeing more direct involvement of donors in the, sort of the design and the execution of data review, analytical projects, things of that nature. Thank you very much um, for this question. Yes, I think uh, actually donors uh, have an interest uh, to get more uh, involved into that. Um, so uh, uh, what comes to mind is one study we have done on uh, risks, for example, and there we looked at different contexts, humanitarian contexts, and really uh, uh, looked at how different donors, uh, UN agencies, as well as humanitarian organizations, um, uh, perceive uh, the the situation, um, uh, how they deal with the data, um, and uh, so I would say there is increasingly uh, uh, a, a higher interest. Um, but of course, it also comes with some constraints, and one of those is the capacity. Uh, many donor states they have a limited uh, capacity, um, so that's uh, one of the limitations. Um, then, of course, we want um, organizations and agency to really have uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, capacities in that regard. So I think um, there's a, a high interest to uh, even uh, build more capacities on their side. Um, but yes, I would say generally there is a more uh, uh, increased interest uh, to, to get involved. Um, but it comes with uh, the limitations that I mentioned. It's not because uh, there's no interest, but it's just uh, due to the nature of, 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 of the limitation of resources. Thanks so much, Jonas. Maybe just one quick additional observation on that. I think what we've seen through this process, but also in other aspects of the humanitarian data ecosystem and the different types of work being done, 
is the more proactive or present engagement that you describe from the donor side can be a productive way of really making a more coherent approach to investments in this area. So one additional aspiration for the framework is to give us a common set of things to be considering from both the organizational humanitarian organizational side and the donor side so that there is a one to many impact of an investment, for example, in a hub for analysis or in a common assessment of risks of a particular data type in a given setting. It's not that every organization needs to do that themselves every time they're collecting that type of data. We should be doing that collectively where possible and also communicating in the same way to our donors about the sensitivities of the data or how it can and will be shared. And I'll use that to also just quickly answer the question in the chat about silos and, and whether that might not or the desire to break down silos might not run against the uh, sort of desire to or responsibility to protect the data. And I would say there's a difference between siloing and protecting, right? So if we're talking about protecting the data, but sharing the data that we can, that will enable us to break down what might be silos, which are just getting in the way of data being shared that can be shared, whether that's because of confusion about the sensitivity of that data or a lack of a process or the lack of an instrument that might be required by one or another institution's policy framework. We need to be able to understand what the barriers are to data sharing, both within the humanitarian community, broadly understood, but also with the increasingly diverse group of actors involved in humanitarian action. And there are some discussions throughout the rest of the week that will help us unpack that a bit more. I don't think there are any other questions in the chat. So just checking quickly again here in the room. Any last questions for our panelists? Yes, Amos. Sorry, Stuart, just on that last point, how do we in the sector, how do we have these discussions across multiple like clusters or so like you and I have been involved in lots of discussions within the cash space, but this is a relevant question and conversation across the piece. Um, and where do we have those types of conversations or how do we encourage them maybe? Yeah, I think it's a great question and I might put it to uh, at least one or two of the panelists to, to respond because it's part of the next step here in terms of putting this framework into practice is figuring out where these discussions need to happen, what groups exist, but also where there might be gaps in terms of convening platforms and spaces for dialogue. So uh, I'll turn and just go sort of from the order that we started with Vincent, then to Fanny, and then Jonas for a final word, either reflections on sort of how we move forward from here, a call to action for people who are in the room or online, or any short final thoughts you would like to share. I think yeah, there's different levels, and I don't think I don't have the answer. One answer on on uh, on our side from the uh, Red Cross Red Cross movement is that it's clearly a topic that is uh, of interest, uh, a growing interest in the movement. There was a number. I mean, the, a few years ago, we had a resolution at the international conference on the. Uh, Protection of the protection of the privacy and, and data protection principle of, in in reestablishment of family link activities, and now we're growing. Uh, we had two years ago last year a resolution uh, in the Council of Delegates regarding the preservation of of um, humanitarian data. So basically, within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, there's more and more reflection on joint approaches, on joint policies, and we will put this up on the agenda of the international conference uh, next year. So that's only one level, but the uh, international conference brings all the national societies, so Red Cross, Red Crescents, uh, uh, together with the ICRC and the IFRC and states. So it's a place where we can have this conversation, but it's just one among others. Yeah, I think the work going forward will be implementing uh, this framework. And as Vincent said, there's many ways to do this. I think maybe a good plug here on the humanitarian organization side is uh, we do have a data responsibility working group. Uh, this is uh, currently not yet involving donors, but we are currently looking into how we can create maybe a, a dialogue, an interface uh, that, that can work towards that. But that is a working group that is made up of a number of or operational agencies that come together to discuss issues related to data management, data sharing, um, and, and other similar issues. So 
I think the way forward is to keep this dialogue open and to focus on the maximization rather than the minimization aspect of this, uh, to see data responsibility as a way to better share data rather than to limit sharing data. I think that's what I'll leave it at. Great. Jonas, a last word. Thank you. Last word is always the most difficult one. No, but um, so I think in addition to what uh, Vincent and Fanny said, of course, we um, can also use uh, various donor support groups of agencies as well as humanitarian organizations. So really the, uh, the, the format where uh, donors come together. Um, there's international conferences such as ECOS uh, uh, the International uh, Red Cross Red Crescent Conference that's coming up, uh, the Digitarium Symposium, which is also an uh, initiative uh, organized uh, by ICRC under the umbrella of the HDTI. Um, so I think there's various opportunities, but the most important thing is to really put it out there to the relevant communities. Um, so that it's uh, specifically discussed uh, amongst donors and humanitarian organizations. Um, but most importantly, um, and that's also my final word here, uh, I think it's it's very important that this is perceived as a common endeavor. So it's not either donors or humanitarian organizations, but it's really something we have to tackle together. And also uh, this framework now is out there, but it's not uh, set in stone. So it could be that, you know, with uh, evolving practices, one has to adapt one or the other thing. Um, so it should be a living process in a sense, a living conversation to uh, keep sharing our understanding and improve uh, the situation and have this gold standard out there, which is uh, hopefully implemented uh, to the maximum possible extent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vincent, Fanny, and Jonas for your interventions here. I think it's a really great space to be starting this conversation about the next phase of work on this issue. And we really are grateful to everyone in the room and online who are interested in this topic and want to come find us either virtually or in person to continue the discussion. So many thanks to everybody for joining. We will share uh, the recording as well as the links to the various resources as a follow up to this event. And if you are here in Geneva, come find us. Let's think together about how we can move forward on this framework and support more safe, ethical and effective management of data and humanitarian action. Thanks everybody and have a great day.